So uh, my name is uh, Adrian Moreno, and I, I work for Red Hat for the networking team. And um, I'm here today to present um, a new tool that I have uh, written with my two colleagues, Antoine Tenard and Paolo Valerio. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about um, networking and debugging and tracing. So um, well, this is a short agenda. I will try to go fast through the slides and um, run a live demo, although given the situation, I don't know if I should just. <laughs> anyway, um, let's just uh, jump directly to the problem. The problem that we're trying to solve is um, network visibility and network tracing. And for at least for me, um, this is a three-dimensional problem, um, meaning we have, uh, on, the on the one hand, we have uh, many components in the Linux kernel. So we, have, we can have a packet in the uh, TCP stack, UDP stack, uh, TC, um, net filter. We can have it in OVS. OVS is especially complicated um, because the packet temporarily goes to user space and then it gets re-injected into the kernel. So it's, there are many places where a packet can be. Um, but on each of those places, um, we uh, not only have the packets that we want to look uh, to, we, want, we have all sorts of packets. So our packets, our traffic is hidden among lots of other packets. So we need good filtering. But apart from that, um, the packets mutate over time. So filters um, get stale. I, I, uh, you can filter on the source IP address, and then the source IP address might change because you do something like nothing. So um, it's really complicated. You have these three dimensions to try to find your packets and know where they are and what happened to them in the, in the kernel. So um, looking at the existing tools, we have, of course, venerable TCP dump. Um, we all love the PCAP filtering. Um, uh, we, you can express any filter and it just works. It's, it's like, and, and it's of course the seed of eBPF, so our respects. Um, we have all the tools like Dropwatch, which is just focused on drops. Um, it gives you the stack trace of each drop. It's really nice. Um, we have PWRU. Um, if there's someone that hasn't tried this tool, I recommend you to use it. It's awesome. Um, it probes many different places. And, um, and we also have tools like BPF Trace, Perf, System Tap, which are slightly complicated, uh, to say the least, but uh, very, very powerful. So um, with all this, what is Redis? And what is the tool that we've written? We can give a. a, a definition. It's a, to, a tracing tool um, that gives contextual information uh, of different places in the stack. But you can also think of it as TCP dump plus PWRU plus perf times Rust. Um, of course, we haven't put all the features of these tools into ours, but we do have, uh, we, we have gotten a lot of inspiration, lots of nice things that we like from these, fee uh, from these tools, we have kind of integrated them. So if you do know these tools, you might feel that something you know, sounds familiar. So uh, let's just jump into how to use Redis and try to understand this tool. And for us to understand this tool, uh, we just can jump into an example. This is an example of Redis and the output that it just prints. OK, so if we, if we understand this, we understand Redis and what it does. Um, so first of all, Redis is based, um, it has something that we call collectors. Collectors tell Redis what data to extract. So for instance, we have the SKB collector there. And the SKB collector collected information from the SKBuff from the packet. So that line, which resembles TCP dump output, um, 
is what the SKB collector generated. Um, apart, uh, we also have the NFT collector there. The NFT collector generated that little line down there, which is NF tables um, chain, verdict, uh, and, uh, and table. So collectors collect data and, uh, and um, extract information from the kernel. And on the other half, uh, hand, we have something called probes. Probes tell Redis where to look for packets. Um, some of the probes can be explicit. So in this case, we have over there an explicit probe. So we told Redis, please get into uh, the kprobe IPRCV, which is a well-known uh, function in the IP stack. And therefore, um, that probe was, um, well, that, that kprobe uh, was probed. Basically, we attached a, um, an EBBF program there, and collectors collected the available information. So some of them are explicit, but some of them are automatic. Like, for instance, the NFT, pro, uh, the NFT collector. The NFT collector, you cannot just collect net, uh, net filter, like um, NF table information from anywhere in the, in the kernel. So it, it, it automatically added that uh, probe in a, sp in a special place in, in, uh, in the kernel where this information is available. So we have probes and collectors, and if we start combining them, we try to, uh, we, we, we think we're able to achieve a fairly good low-level tool uh, for, for network tracing. Um, we have many existing collectors. I'm going to just quickly go through these slides um, uh, because we, we don't have much time uh, because of the uh, delay at the beginning. We have the SKB collector, um, collects packet information. Uh, we have the NFT collector, which also we shown in the, in the first example. Um, you can filter, it, it can do something really cool, which is filter on the verdict uh, of the net filter rule. Uh, we have SKB drop, ex extracts uh, drop reasons uh, from a special function in the kernel. Uh, we have SKB tracking because we do extensive tracking of, um, of packets. So um, that is uh, a very important feature in, inside Redis. Um, we have an OVS collector. So just a small reminder of how OVS works uh, for those of you that uh, might not be familiar. In OVS, we have a kernel data path, um, but it's, it acts like a cache. So it's empty at the beginning, and the first time we see a packet, we send it to uh, a user space daemon where we process it and we determine what to do with it. And then we put the packet back into the kernel alongside a flow that tells the kernel data path what to do with similar packets. So then the next packet, which looks similar, will be just processing the kernel data path. So we have an OVS collector um, which does exactly that. Um, traces, adds some automatic probes uh, in the kernel data path and uh, the user space daemon in order to um, extract all this information. This is a, a short summary table of, uh, of these collectors. And we found a problem, which is as we start adding probes and probes, um, since they are explicit, like many of them are explicit, um, we end up having very long command lines. And we need kernel knowledge to actually know what to probe. Right? Um, so this might be obvious for a, net, a kernel networking um, engineer, but might not be obvious for, for, um, for the rest. So we developed something called profiles. So it's just a YAML file um, where we list the probes. Uh, we enable the collectors. And it's a very simple, easy to share, easy to ship in, uh, in your distro packets or whatever. Uh, easy to write one for specific use cases and, um, and have it ready for, for your debugging sessions. So you just enable the profile and that's it. Um, and one of my favorite features, we have pickup filtering. So 
same syntax as TCP dump, exactly the same. If it works in TCP dump, it will most likely work in Redis. Uh, um, it's it's like 99 percent. I, I think like in for most common use cases, um, it will work. Um, and uh, yeah, Redis gets that, translates it to BPF, translates BPF to eBPF, and inserts it into a kernel for filtering. And um, uh, similar to perf a little bit, uh, events can be stored in files and um, for easy pass processing. And events in this case are just JSON. So you can do any kind of post processing. You can write your own post processing in, in Python or whatever and, and, and um, get some more insights from, from your uh, events. We have an, um, one of the built-in post processors um, is the sort uh, event, uh, the sort command, which I will show you in a live demo, actually. So fingers crossed, bear with me. So this uh, is um, a very challenging. OK, so. Um, Uh, sorry, I had to reboot the machine just seconds before starting, so um, I hope my script works. <laughs> um, okay, so I have a, a very simple setup here. So we have two mm, um, network devices attached to two na network namespaces, a private one and a public one, and we're just natting, like masquerading between them, okay? So um, for instance, if I, um, I'm going to enter the private, um, the private uh, network namespace, and I'm going to ping um, So uh, I have connectivity with the public one. So I'm going to just also uh, verify this. So this is the. I'm, I'm pinging this IP address, right? And um, OK, I have a cache. OK, so I'm going to capture the packet as, I, uh, as it's received. And as you can see, um, the, the source IP address is not the source IP address that I have here. So there is nothing going on, OK? Um, so let's see how Redis can, can uh, let me keep that ping flowing. And um, so um, I have some profiles installed. So I have a UDP profile. I have a, also a generic profile, uh, NFT profile. The generic profile is shipped with Redis and it's uh, with V1 at least, and uh, it's a generic, uh, pretty e um, useful for starting a debugging session. So I'm going to use the generic profile and the NFT one, right? And I'm going to collect, I'm going to filter on host 192.168.102. And uh, OK, so that's interesting. Um, <laughs> hmm. OK, so a uh, live demo, of course, is not working. Um, hmm. Why is not okay? Okay, sorry. So, sorry for that. Um, the I have a plan B, which is I have a um, oh gosh, but this is not visible, is it? Um, do we see something there? Oh, 
Oh my God! Sorry, sorry, guys. So, um, can we do like zoom in? Uh, uh, I just rebooted this machine before, and uh, you guys see something? Well. Um, these are um, events, okay? So uh, I just run the NFT, um, the NFT uh, collector, and this printed uh, a bunch of um, of events, right? Um, what I wanted to show you is um, uh, this is just um, putting some events into a file called events.json. Okay, so events are stored in a file, and um, after that, uh, I can run the short uh, the short command. When I type short events.json, ready short events.json, this is the output. So as you can see here, at least visually, I hope you can see that uh, most of the events are indented. This is because uh, we detected the first packet, and we uh, identified that the rest of the events belong to the same packet. And we identify that even through nothing. So at some point, the source IP address of the events changed from here, which is 192.168.102, uh, and, um, and it become another one, right? So. Um, Basically, we, uh, with, this, with this demo, I wanted to demonstrate that um, uh, um, we can uh, get events uh, all around the network stack. So IP receive, we get uh, the IP forwarding, we get NATing, we get mass, like um, NAT manip manipulate functions. We see the NATing going on, and we see the packet being received. Um, later on uh, in, uh, in this demo, um, I increase the rate of the, um, I increase the rate of uh, the ping, and I see that some packets are being dropped. So doing the same uh, experiment, like doing collecting the events and shorting them, I can look at the drop and I can see how, um, maybe you don't see it, but at some point you see a drop in the NF table, uh, an NFT event, dropping the packet, which has a different source IP address than the one I put in the filter. So even though I was filtering on the source IP address and the source IP address changed, um, I was able to, um, detect that and detect that that packet, specifically that one, got dropped because um, I had a, a net filter rule in egress which um, dropped it. And at the end, I see this um, SKB drop event with the SKB uh, drop event uh, reason, which is in this case is um, net filter drop. Um, uh, also, there's another way to see it. Um, there's an, an um, we can enable uh, just the um, NFT, sorry, just the SKB drop and the NFT um, probes, uh, sorry, collectors, and put the option minus minus stack. The minus minus stack will um, will print the stack trace of uh, each event. So we will capture the events uh, as they get, uh, the packets as they get dropped, and print the stack trace. This is similar to DropWatch, if, uh, you, if you know the tool, okay? Um, and uh, here, again, pretty small, I think. Um, Uh, sorry about that. So um, in this other demo, um, I have uh, OpenVSwitch set up. And in the OpenVSwitch setup, 
um, just two namespaces communica communicating each other through um, OBS. And in this, in this um, uh, particular example, I use uh, UDP, uh, a DNS resolution. So I, I, I run a DNS server on one side and um, a, D, a DNS client, basically a DIG, on the other side. Um, this is what I was telling you about. So this is the cache, the content of the flow cache. Okay? The first time we see a packet flowing, two entries appear, two flows appear in the, in the uh, kernel cache. Um, for uh, any other UDP packet will hit that flow and directly be uh, output to the right port. Uh, and after a while, the cache um, entry gets invalidated, expires, and, um, and gets flushed. So in this uh, particular example, um, what, we, what we see is, um, of course, we, we have a profile that helps, um, uh, helps in this use case. The profile defines some traces in the UDP stack and some traces in the OVS stack. Profiles can be combined uh, with each other. So in this case, we have two completely independent, self-contained profiles that, when combined, uh, will help us debug this particular case uh, in which maybe we have uh, some latency in, uh, in UDP resolutions. So um, we start collecting. We execute the, um, the example. We stop collecting, and we run again the sort command and here the sort command gives us a very big uh, a path of events that belong to the same packet okay and um, of course it's not very visible here but at some point so we see packets in the the port of the um, of the source um, net, uh, network namespace we see um, the uh, event, uh, sorry, we see the SKB going from one name, network namespace to another because we list also the network namespace in which we see the packet. We see it being received by OVS. We see it being processed by OVS. We see it being upcalled by OVS to user space. Um, we see it being received by OVS in user space, so we know that it wasn't dropped in the middle, like we didn't overflow the Netlink socket that we use. Um, we then saw um, a, a, a flow being put, like a flow being configured because of this packet, and we saw a flow being executed, meaning the packet being re-injected into the kernel. Um, and then we see events uh, where the kernel receives the packet and executes an action, which in this case is an output action to port whatever. Uh, and then the next event here is VETH transmit, again, again goes back to the VETH, uh, and up the UIP stack and the UDP stack of the DNS server. So we see the entire flow even uh, in user space. Um, and, um, uh, of course, if we scroll down to the next event, okay, so um, if we scroll down to the next event, what we see is the next packet didn't go through user space. And we see uh, OVS DP execute action. Uh, right after it being received by OBS, meaning we are able to see which packets go to user space, which packets uh, stay in the kernel, and we can see drops or any, mm, uh, any unexpected behavior with packets even in user space. Okay. Yeah, I'm really sorry I couldn't do this live, uh, but, you know. Um, so I can show it here in a little bit bigger. So this is the output of the short command. You see the, uh, the first line is the first time we see the packet. Oh, sorry, let me. Oh, anyway, 
Um, the first line is the first time we see the packet. We see here in the IPRCV, and then we see NF contract, NF contract I ICMP, nothing going on, right? So we see um, uh, all the events shorted. It's like TCP dumping everywhere in the kernel and being able to see it in a nice shorted manner. Um, and uh, what's next? Uh, we have so we have just released um, the first version. Uh, we have many many collectors uh, in uh, planned. We want to add contract TC uh, container integration. We want an, an embedded Python integration, uh, terminal user interface, and whatever uh, people suggest. Right, so uh, w contributions uh, are welcome. Um, this, that's the GitHub uh, repo, and uh, you can just uh, create an issue and suggest profiles uh, and uh, any other f uh, feature that uh, you would like uh, us to work on. And um, that's it. Uh, sorry, uh, the demo didn't work. Uh, last last minute. Uh, issues as always and um, that's it if there are any questions and uh <laughs> yes Paul so there are different uh, techniques so inside the kernel, we trace um, the SKB. The first time we use the SKB head, and we track whenever the data pointer changes, so we know when it mutates. Um, but essentially, we use uh, pointers inside the SKB to track when uh, when when the event belongs to to that same SKB. When we um, in OVS, we don't have uh, a very good infrastructure for, for, for tracing packets from the kernel to user space. So then we, what we do is we get uh, hash from different parts of the packet because we, we don't have an SKB struct in OVS. Uh, we just have a, the bytes, right? So we, we hash it. We use other techniques to track the packet through OVS because we there are several places where where um, OVS like, installs flows and, and and does things like that, and then we also hash the packet when OVS reinjects the packet into the kernel. So that's how we and then we kind of combine both tracking information into a single one for us to be able to short. That uh, all those events. Yeah. So on top of this, there's no just a you know trace team and using different styles and jumping to user space. So is there a combination of many different parameters which make you lose track of this packet? Because okay, in kernel you can trace this effectively at any point in time. So whatever I mutate in the past, you will be able to always trace this particular packet. But if I do jump to user Um, I, I don't think we can trace any user space application that can change the packet in any way. Like, we cannot do it in a generic way. That's what I mean. Uh, we can do it in OVS, because we know how OVS works. I happen to work in the OVS team. So um, we use OVS internal knowledge to know what OVS does and um, to the packet. Um, in addition to that, uh, uh, we expose uh, user-defined trace points in, in um, user statically defined trace points, USDT. Uh, so we allow uh, in, in OVS in user space. So OVS cr has hooks for eBPF programs to, to, you know, um, to be run. 
So this uh, allows us to extract that information in very specific like key places. Of course, not all applications might do that. And each, um, let's say, each data path or control path that we want to monitor, we would need a specific collector that knows how to do that. So yeah, um, I'm hoping that we can add our, our other user space applications, uh, like other control planes, other programs that alter and modify the, um, the, the behavior of packets. Um, and, uh, but yeah, not in a generic way. Uh, no, we don't have a user interface at the moment. We just have the, the CLI. Uh, we are, we, we, we would like to add a terminal user interface similar to what Perf has, where you can have all the events, inspect them, e expand these, these little tables, and uh, collapse them, uh, filter, and things like that. So we want a user, a terminal user interface. But yeah, we're, it's just uh, in the in the backlog. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, it's. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. So okay, so. Um, it, the, the, the question was, um, how do we do the, um, how do we convert the pickup filter into eBPF? Um, yes, we do use pickup, lib pickup, to convert it to legacy BPF. And then we mangle, we basically manually convert instructions from BPF to eBPF. They are mostly a one to one relationship, but uh, not exactly. And, and so we co create an eBPF program that has that functionality, that filter, and we attach it to the rest of our eBPF programs. So that's pretty cool, actually. <laughs> okay, thank you.